This is Kilcatton Bay, named after St. Catton, who was the uncle of St. Blaine. In the 1800s, it was just a small fishing settlement, but over the next hundred years, it grew. First of all, with the start of the lime kiln, which was built in the late 1800s, and the lime was extracted and exported then from the stone quay, which was built. Later on, a t- tiles were manufactured. They were exported from the stone quay, as were early potatoes too. And then, in the late 19th century and early 20th century, visitors started arriving from the Clyde. Great busloads and steamers would come with the visitors, and these visitors had to be accommodated. So at one time, there were 13 shops here, and the houses were built for these richer people to stay in during the summer months. Now, people still come here for holidays, and you see the fishing boats and the yachts, and people come here to stay to experience the beauty of the bay, watching the birds forage for food and listening to them and enjoying the beauty of the area. Kingarth Stone Circle. There are three standing stones remaining in what was once a larger prehistoric stone circle. One of them has fallen and been re-erected, and it is not at all clear what form the original setting took. The southernmost stone, a large block of conglomerate, bears numerous graffiti, including what appears to be a small incised cross with expanded terminals. The mist is dispersing this morning and the sun is coming out and we are going to walk from Kilcatton Bay around the hills and away to the ruins of St Blaine's Chapel. We're on the West Island Way now, walking down towards St Blaine's Chapel. And in the distance, we can see Arran, the Isle of Arran. And the people of Butte say that's the best place to see it from Butte. The ruins of St Blaine's Chapel are now in sight in a secluded grove. We've come to the outer wall of St Blaine's Chapel uh, with the, the gap in the wall which looks as if it was the entrance to it and just before that we've noticed the, uh, the base which would have held a stone cross. Now there's just the socket remaining. This wall defines the boundary between the monastery and the secular world beyond it. What we see here are the ruins of the Norman church dedicated to St Blaine. But in the 6th century, a Celtic monastery was believed to be established by St Catton on higher ground above the present day farm. The ruin, St Blaine's, takes its name from St Catton's nephew, Blaine. The rectangular building within the lower burial ground the fragmented remains of cells along the foot of the cliff 
and the enclosure wall probably date from this period. It is believed that the monastery was destroyed towards the end of the 8th century by the Vikings. The medieval church and the upper burial ground possess fine 12th century workmanship. The building which now exists contains elements of the parish church dating from around 1135, but not the earlier monastery. The builder of these oldest surviving parts may have been Norse, perhaps Olaf the Red, father-in-law of Summerled. As a chronicler shortly after his death commented, he, Olaf, gave to the churches of the islands lands and privileges and was, with respect to divine worship, devout and fervent. Olaf died in 1143. The typically Norman rounded arch was built when the nave was added. The zigzag design above it and the diagonal crosses of the carved band running round the nave are also Norman in character. The third Marquis of Butte rebuilt and strengthened the walls of the chapel, putting in slates as he did so, to show where the original walling ended and the reconstruction began. In the burial ground is a long tombstone, triangular in section. This is traditionally Blaine's tombstone, though it is unlikely to be the case and more likely to be a marker stone for Viking burials. Other stone of the same design can be seen in the long grass. There were once many carved stones in the burial ground, there are still some in place, covered with moss and grass, which serves as a protective covering. Here is a well, though we can't see any water there at the moment, but this well was thought to be used during the life of the monastery, many hundreds of years ago. These are remains of ancient buildings from the monastic time. Butchire Natural History Society guidebook talks about this structure, the Devil's Cauldron. The Devil's Cauldron is a conspicuous structure but baffling to anyone wishing to interpret it. The walls are massive, almost megalithic in character from the huge stones employed. Suggestions for its use include a place of penance, an Irish tower, uh, well a tower comparable to Irish towers, a building very much earlier than the Celtic settlement and a megalomaniac's dwelling. Excavation alone could give the answer. On the seashore below St Blaine's Chapel is the impressive ancient hill fort of Donegal, which means Fort of the Stranger. There are two hill forts on this site. Behind me is the little one and we can see a cave there too where people would have lived thousands of years ago. And also there is the possibility that there were Viking longhouses in this area as well. Behind me now is the larger of the two hill forts towering up in the landscape. Donegal must be one of the most important Late Bronze Age or Early Iron Age sites in Scotland in use for over 1,000 years, certainly until about AD 1200 and possibly beyond. Given the size, complexity and position of the site, it may have been the principal strategic base for control of the Clyde approaches. Donegal is composed of the Strong Point or Sisdale and the Bailey, a defendable open area into which livestock, for example, could be herded in case of attack. The fort is, in essence, entirely geological, with twin ridges of a basalt sill. One forms a citadel and the other surrounds the inlined side of a small corrie. Donegal cannot possibly have functioned in isolation, even though that is precisely how one thinks of it during a siege. In reality, it must have enjoyed a very close interrelationship with the hinterland, particularly St Blaine's. Prehistoric and Norse activity is evident on both sites. Grain would have been grown where possible, and livestock would probably have been folded at St Blaine's, except in times of danger, 
when it would be driven into the Donegoyle Bailey. Donegoyle is famous as a vitrified fort. Vitrification occurs when the stones are fused by intense heat. This occurred as a deliberate act of destruction. The remaining scraps of the vitrified wall are mainly right on top of the citadel. Imagine the great pall of smoke created by burning the walls. It would have been seen for miles around, sending a message of triumph to allies of the victors and a message of despair to those, probably in other hill forts in Butte, that the game was up. On the map, this seems to be marked as a burial chamber, but whether it is or not, it is very difficult to say to us. It just looks part of the organic landscape. It certainly makes you think when you come to landscapes which were inhabited thousands of years ago and are now mainly sheep and rabbits. It makes you think, well, what will our legacy be? Standing here in this ancient hill fort at the most southerly point on Butte, it seems a fitting place to finish our exploration of the south end of the Isle of Butte.